Uh, welcome to the Gray Swan Guild Book Festival 2023 edition. We just had Ralph Mercer talking about causal layered analysis and other forms of poetry. I am excited and honored again in my life to work with Louise Mowbray, Mowbray by Design, a genius, a writer, a world traveler, a historian. Her focus on resilience in the world and her thinking makes the world a better place. So thank you for joining us, Louise. I'll leave you to introduce yourself and about your new project, about your fresh publication, which I believe is available almost today-ish, but you'll tell us about that too. Please, Louise, thank you for joining us. And uh, you can take the screen away from me when you need to. Thanks, Rob. Thank you for the introduction. And before I even start, perhaps we, if you can stop sharing, I don't have anything to share immediately. That would be great. And I just wanted to say to Rolf, you know, Gina Clifford and I had the absolute pleasure of talking to Rolf on camera um, not so long ago, a month or two ago. And uh, it, it was absolutely amazing. And you know, when you meet somebody and you just think, I, I absolutely want to spend more time getting to know what this person understands about the world, because there's something there that I, I want and, and need. So thank you, Rolf. That was, that was absolutely brilliant. And well done on the new book. Very exciting. So, um, gosh, I feel like I've been at, like on this extraordinary race all year. I contributed to the Uncertainty book. Uh, I think that was published or we were done around about eight, March, April, I forget. This year has just been a, a total blur. And I, I got the bug, you know, <laughs> I was bitten. <laughs> and uh, I started writing and I have not stopped. And this book that I've just written, it's called um, Relevant, uh, wrote me. I, you know, I, I almost feel as if I didn't have much to do with, with what happened. And then at the end, there was a whole bunch of organizing and getting things in, into kind of a reasonably logical fashion. But as Ralph just said, um, you know, life, people, how we behave, how we organize ourselves, how we deal with stress and uncertainty and how we actually make our way through the world is not a linear process. And I was um, chuckling the other day, a friend of mine said to me, why didn't you just write five rules for leadership? <laughs> and uh, that really made me laugh. And I, I think what I, what I need to do is give you a little bit of my background so that you can understand my personal journey um, through business and leadership, which, hopefully when you read the book will make sense as to how I make sense of the world and how every single client I've ever worked with and every company I've worked with and my, and all of their clients um, have really helped shape my lenses on the world. And um, these are a lot of the lenses that I share in this book, along with some other kind of formal lenses, I guess things that actually originated out of academia that I really believe leaders need today. So the whole, I guess, you know, one has to filter this into a sort of easily understandable way. It would be a bunch of filters or lenses on the world or way of understanding the world that I believe leaders absolutely need today um, and well into the future. And it's not a short term, you know, like here's something that you need to get through the next year. It's something that once you actually embed these lenses for yourself, now talk a little bit about embedding and reframing, um, you get to keep them. And that's the brilliant part of it. You know, a lot of what I do is um, based on all sorts of findings and neuroscience and understanding of how our minds and bodies works, work, that brain body connection. Um, and without that understanding, it's very difficult to take on any topic um, and actually keep it because cerebrally we get it you know we're all bright and smart and we understand how things work and we we might have heard things a hundred times but it doesn't mean we can do that thing easily and um, unconsciously unconscious competence where we're just flying by the seat of our pants and we can recognize what's going on make sense of it and make better decisions 
And ultimately, you know, for those people who do read the book, that's what I'm hoping that they will, um, that they will leave with is a better way of filtering what's going on around them and making better decisions. So I think what I'd like to do is to just change my background. I try to be clever here. I wish I had some technology. I think, is it, mm, I'm not quite sure how to say it, the triple M H <laughs> program that allows you to do all sorts of floating backgrounds, but I don't have that. So I thought what I'd do is share, let's see if that's working. Yeah, there we go. Is to share the journey through the book. And I'll talk you through a little bit of my background as I do. Uh, I believe that this is up in ebook format. The print will be out um, in about a week, so mid month. And the just to give you a, a sort of a bit of a background, my I started my career in the investment banking sector and then in technology. And at some point, I went to go and see an executive search firm. I was looking for a new job, and they said, "Well, why don't you come and do this?" And it happened to be a listed executive search firm, and with. 60 consultants alone in London and I joined them and found my kind of golden thread and I think that you know often when we talk to people it's like what is your golden thread you know is it strategy is it finance is it do numbers dance on a page for you as you know a little like musical notes what is your thing and by that time I realized that sort of people and understanding how people work and why they make the decisions that they do across all sorts of business needs. That was the thing, that was my thing. And those years in executive search were absolutely extraordinary. I think one thing that executive search gives you is the ability to understand how organizations work. And you cannot hold on to your own ego or your own idea because your job is to get yourself out of the way and make a great match, um, and many of them. So, <laughs> Um, so that's exactly what I did for a few years and then found it with um, a couple of other co-founders, an executive search firm in London, purely focused on dot com and the new economy. So that will tell you exactly how long I've been around. And uh, we had an amazing ride for a couple of years until and we worked purely with the venture capital community, investing in all the sort of some of the same names that are still around today, like lastminute.com and all of the founders of that time. My business partner was one of the founders of First Tuesday. So that incredible ride, seeing how um, VCs evaluated organizations, where the big money went, how founders actually pulled their businesses together, you know, how they actually got them to market, all of the different funding rounds, an extraordinary journey, amazing insight, and I learned so much. So the corporate side, I learned working for the listed company, and then of course, you know, the entrepreneurial side really got me with um, with the company that I co-founded. And then I then read a, a book by a Newsweek economist called the Fall, the Fall of the New Economy. I've still got it somewhere in my um, bookshelf, and realized, of course, when you when you work in executive search, you're almost the canary in the minefield. You can feel exactly what's going on in the market. The retainers stop, um, business dries up, nothing's moving, and realized that was the end of the game. And a few months later, the markets crashed. Fortunately, we got out early, we paid out redundancies rather than putting everybody through misery. And I then happened to be um, in the Middle East for a few years and um, was did a bit of consulting there, quite dry stuff, but it was an education and um, and then became managing director for a British company across the Middle East, North Africa. An extraordinary experience in terms of cultures. And I just need to loop back a bit. I grew up in South Africa. I was born in Cape Town, uh, um, British parents, but um, they, I think they thought they'd be in Cape Town for a couple of years and, and landed up um, staying. And um, so I had this amazing upbringing in Africa, you know, Southern Africa at least. And then, um, um, 20 odd years in London and a stint in the Middle East, during which time 9-11 happened. And when you're already culturally sensitive or tuned in to, to what the zeitgeist, what's going on um, amongst people and organizations, I think an event like that really is an extraordinary learning experience. And when I got back to London and I started the business I have today, I was determined to only do what I was deeply 
connected to, I was about to say passionate, but it's such an overused word, but passionate connected to something that really felt true to me, true to my values. And that was building, helping leaders to build organizations and helping leaders to, um, to stand in their personal power. And I don't mean power over, I mean personal power. And when I started my business, uh, of course, digital was just starting to pop. All of our platforms were started during that time. And I realized pretty quickly that executives would need an online presence. And I heard this term personal brand, which sounded pretty cheesy to me and not easily digested, certainly by the British market, based in London, my clients are European, mostly. And, um, but anyway, I, I knew there was something in it. I knew the world had changed. And in about 2005, six, I developed a program which I went on, on to deliver countless times um, and coached and worked with teams, uh, both in the corporate, people in the public eye and people in politics and lectured for a number of business schools. And by the time I got to about 2010, 2011, I knew I needed a coaching qualification and I decided I only wanted to do something that lit my fire and came across conscious uh, leadership. And that once again shifted and changed my focus. I don't, I've always been, I guess, kind of curious. So I delved into a lot of practices over time, but conscious leadership brought everything together for me. It got to the, the baseline, the foundation of what it means to lead and what it means to be, to know thyself. Uh, you know, the foundation of all growth and development is self-awareness, self-knowledge, self-mastery. And it also really opened my eyes to the world of conscious business. And I think after the markets crashed in September 2008, and I write about um, this in the book, um, I can remember standing in, in the city in London with an investment banking client, and he had something like 220 sheets of paper with a, a photo of each individual in his team on it and a description. And he had to lose, he had to, to bring the number down to 70 people. And we, his office floor was entirely covered with these sheets of paper with people's photos on them. And he was absolutely distraught. And I remember him sort of picking up a sheet of A4 and waving it in the air and saying, you know, these people are absolutely brilliant. Why, why should I fire this guy? You know, because he, he wore a green tie on a, on a Wednesday. It's that arbitrary. And it was an extraordinary time. And I think if, if you were involved in business at that time in those sort of markets, you really felt it. And um, coming out of that, I think the world started picking up on this conscious business, this conscious capitalism, this conscious leadership piece. And it would take a pandemic and the extraordinary context changing over the last four years for us now starting to see that language popping in the media and popping in corporate culture. Um, but before then, it really, I, I wondered if there would ever be a tipping point and it would sort of start shifting into mainstream. One of the things that helped, apart from the fact that um, you know, the, the markets crashed and our, our world's book fell apart, uh, practically, you know, practically speaking, as well as anything else, um, was, the, was the fact that consumers were becoming much more economic, uh, environmentally savvy, I should say, and socially savvy. So this triple bottom line idea, uh, you know, really uh, taking care of the environment and society as social media has grown and our interconnectivity, of course, there are a whole bunch of downsides too, um, but so too has our awareness of the issues at play. And by the time I got to about 2017, I was invited to go and join a futures um, course. And I took up the offer and it blew my world apart in the way that, I don't know if you've ever sat in a learning environment and just started laughing because it's exactly how you think naturally. <laughs> I mean, and where had this stuff been for so long and why weren't we using it in business to actually make better sense of what, what was going, what's actually going on at any moment in time. 
And that's what futures did for me. And the minute that I started bringing it into everything that I do with my clients, it started having extraordinary results. So the combination of conscious leadership, know thyself, self-awareness, self-knowledge, self-mastery, um, being values-driven, transparent, all of these things that have been such poppy words over the last uh, you know, years, but actually bringing them into being. And then, of course, bringing in some of the, um, the amazing models, frameworks, tools, and thinking the philosophy behind futures uh, was quite extraordinary in terms of results. And I, I'm, a, I'm a stickler for results. Um, if something doesn't work or it doesn't have the impact it needs to have, then, you know, let, find, let's find something else. That's my that's my approach to things. So I've got a kit bag full of stuff. <laughs> and depending on what the client needs, what's appropriate at the time, that's what rolls out. And then a um, couple of years later, um, took some behavioral science um, qualifications and became a practitioner for a bunch of models. It's really interesting, you know, during my headhunting hunting years, I had a lot of insight into various models and tools and frameworks and processes. And, you know, you really get to see from the inside what, what actually is accurate, what's full of bias, what, what gives you a, a sort of, at least a, a very human understanding of the dynamic personalities um, that people have and how they can change in different contexts and in different cultures, because we do change. That's the beautiful thing about human beings. Put us in a different environment and a whole bunch of different things happen. Uh, so I took a really sort of gold class, best in breed, um, some tools that actually help to give people self-awareness and team awareness, organizational understanding uh, very quickly. So it breaks down the initial process that might take quite long in, in a sort of leadership type engagement and you get straight in there. And uh, it's deeply humbling, wonderfully freeing and liberating. So that became part of my kind of kit bag. And I knew I was missing a piece in terms of helping my clients to understand what was going on. And it wasn't until I attended Sonia Blignall's uh, course on complexity, complexity, but I think that was last year. The end of last towards the end of last year, and I suddenly realized that that jigsaw puzzle that I've been putting together with various different lenses and understanding on the world that were working with my clients, um, suddenly that that was the piece of understanding. And I'm a great believer that I need to get something in order to be able to give it. There's no point in me rolling up theories and you know telling people what to do and how to do it and um, if I if I don't get it myself. And um, it doesn't mean that I limit myself to that. <laughs> but if there's something that needs to be integrated, uh, then at least I need to be very sure that it does the job that it's supposed to do. And uh, that was the last piece of the puzzle that eventually led to, led to um, this idea of a bunch of lenses and how we understand the world and being able to filter life through them. Uh, what I'd love to do is just to pause for a moment because I've been going for quite some time <laughs> and uh, find out if there are any questions or queries or anything that's popped up for anyone. Okay, I'm asking you a softball. What was the easiest part about writing this book? Robert was so easy. I was finished by August. It's this last bit that there has been a nightmare. <laughs> the whole thing so, was, the book itself it, it, was it, easy. The words were easy. Yeah, it just flowed. Um, there, is, there isn't anything that I take on in terms of working with clients that I don't take on personally. So it's, 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 I'm, you know, it's not as if I'm a sort of expert in, you know, this year we need to be courageous leaders. You know, next year we need to be transparent leaders. You know, it's kind of meaningless when you look at human beings and how they operate and um, that, that kind of deep understanding that it's not that, you know, I need to get it for myself, but there's no point when, when you use coaching as a foundation for everything that you do. It doesn't matter whether I'm delivering a futures engagement, or whether I'm delivering something around decision making, or it doesn't matter what the topic is, the business topic is. 
unless I can help people to get it for themselves and integrate it for themselves so that they get to use it when I'm not there, <laughs> it is absolutely pointless, you know, doing anything. And I, I think that's always been my key driver. So being able to really integrate that myself and use it time and again with clients, you know, around the world, so lots of different cultures, um, is fundamental to, to how I think and how I do things. And this book isn't just about me. This book is about, you know, how to help people to take on these filters, take on these understandings for themselves. And just in the same way that in a, in a live engagement with clients, I will use everything at my disposal to help them to get it, to keep it. Um, this book does exactly that. So it's not just about telling people what they need to, how they need to think, or what they need to, need to do, but it's give, giving people everything that leads up to, to how it works, and then also things they can do to integrate it for themselves. So great question. <laughs> you sent me great. I've got one more and then we'll go to Basir. You know, it's a well-known yeah. cliche that uh, you can't tell a book by its cover. But when I saw the cover of your book that you shared with us, uh, tell us the story. What's the motivation on the cover? Well, you know, if I think about the thing that I hear a lot, and maybe I'm just tuned into it, of course, you know, if you're going to buy a, I don't know, a red beetle, you, you see every red beetle on the road. Right? But I just keep hearing the word remaining relevant. And I hate the word remaining because it means stay the same. Uh, but what is relevant versus irrelevant? And I think this is the battle that a lot of executives are having at the moment. We are incredibly busy. We're all under stress. We're doing what we set out to do. We've got budgets to meet, you know, we they're pretty much defined over the period of a year. But of course, events don't fit into neat little years. And actually the opening piece after the introduction in this book is about context. Because just, you know, as context eats strategy for, sorry, um, I should say strategy eats culture, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, I think, uh, you know, context eats strategy at whim. And yeah, my apologies. Actually, that was, um, that was a, a draft title. Oh, yeah. And uh, the book is still yeah. relevant, but there's a little bit of a, a play on the word with the a backwards IR um, in front of it, uh, uh, just to, to get, you know, what is this, who do we need to be to be relevant? And if I, I know that if I just trawl through my LinkedIn feed, you know, there is so much advice about who we need to be. It's, it's really tricky. And, you know, we kind of gloss over this stuff because we're, we've been pulled in a billion directions. We're under extraordinary pressure and, I think as I, mean, I said in the, um, the uncertainty book, uh, uncertainty causes an acute stress response. And that's not just being kind of stressed. Acute stress is when everything shuts down brain chemistry wise. We don't make good decisions. You know, we, we don't have perspective. We're not able to filter the world through and um, make sense of things. So there are a whole lot of things at play at the moment that kind of dictate what's going on. And I think people are tired. So, you know, how do, how do we shift away from that? And how do we take on the things that allow us to, to, to be relevant at any given moment in any situation, rather than old thinking, old mental models, old filters that might be inadvertently standing in our way and we're not even aware of it. You know, there's a one of these sort of opening chapters I, I run this book through four parts and the first thing is you know me myself and I you know who am I why do I do the things I do uh, what drives me why do I make the decisions I make and uh, of course then we move on to relating and connecting with others and, and a whole bunch of other things and all the way through this book um, everything that I talk about relates to issues that are going on big issues little issues things we might not think about things that we might not be aware of that have an have you know, extraordinary impact on our lives day to day. And Basir, I'd love to, hi. <laughs> uh, lovely, uh, Louise, uh, you have been uh, away, but you have been certainly very, very busy. So we'll certainly be, I have to uh, get the book. 
having several decades of uh, experience studying perhaps thousands of profiles over the years, there's always this uh, power dynamic or turf war. I'll show them who's the boss. So what would be your advice to, let's say, leaders, irrespective of genders, as to how they should evolve in the next 10 years? Because I think we definitely need your wisdom. Thank you very much. And thank you for your work. Thanks, Basir. You know, it's very interesting. I think everything is contextual. So, I mean, I was coaching a client yesterday and um, who is working with a whole new dynamic, a whole new culture and somebody trying to show who's boss. <laughs> it's a really interesting one. And uh, this is actually, you know, the point of discussion. I think that there is an extra, that there is the, an extraordinary need for all of us to have an internal compass that allows space between us, me and I, <laughs> and what's going on out there. And, you know, th there are various different um, concepts, uh, you know, both in philosophy, well, in philosophy and in, in psychology, and certainly a sort of Buddhist concept of non-attachment and, um, you know, not necessarily being attached to outcomes in the way that a lot of people are and I think the only way that we get there is to know thyself and then get thyself the hell out of the way and um, it's a kind of an interesting interesting way of looking at things there I can give you lists of thousands of things to do but until you have that internal self-knowledge and that self-awareness and the, the ability to make conscious decisions despite how we might normally think or feel about things uh, um, it's very, very tricky to take on any of those things. We almost are imposters because we're trying to do things that we've been told to do, but are not part of who we are. So for me, the most important thing is how do we shift the being that drives the doing? I mean, everything we read about today is all about all the doing. And yes, this book contains a lot of doing, of course, because we've got to apply things in context in the real world. However, it comes from the premise of how can I help you to shift the being that drives the doing. And that's my absolute mission in life. It doesn't matter whether I'm working with a C-suite team of a public company or whether I'm working with an individual executive who won't even put their payments through their company because they don't want that influence. So it's a, it's a very um, basic dynamic of know thyself. And only then can we allow our egos just to step aside for a moment and make decisions that are based not on our, our own, you know, perhaps history or past hurts or, you know, terrible conundrums or hideous failures or wonderful, you know, um, wins, whatever, whatever the stuff is, but to actually make decisions based on the context that we're in and what's appropriate. And that only comes from that deep place of self, self knowledge, self self-awareness thanks for saying that's a great question yeah. thank you wonderful uh solutions uh, solu sets of solutions and uh strategies thank you no thanks for saying. i i don't know how, how much time we've got we've got a a little time left oh yes um we, uh, we run uh you to uh 10 uh sorry uh right to 10 25 and then Q &A. Oh, okay, a lot of time. We've got a lot, plenty of time. <laughs> you're, you're filling uh, us with knowledge and information that always expands. I think there's a theory of relativity there. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I, I'm not mad on slides, but I, I think I will share a slide at this point and just talk you through what's in this book so that you get a sense of the different parts and why they're connected the way they are. Uh, there is some logic to it. Don't worry, I'm not just taking you off on a wild fantasy tour. Although that's that's always fun. When, when do we when do we book that? The Louise Mowbray wild fantasy tour? I think we can get well, a, a, mag a magical mystery tour. Actually, a, a colleague and I just dubbed a new project that was the magical mystery tour, um, and uh, you know, using a, a whole bunch of interesting future stuff too. So, <laughs> so that could be appropriate. But um, mm -hmm. let me see if I can actually share my screen. And let's see if it shows up in the way that I'd like to. You'll have to tell me, otherwise I'll. I'm busily updating your the cover of your book. Okay. Is anybody seeing anything? Uh, not yet. Okay, I think we're going to have to do this the manual way. 
um, just bear with me one second and I'll put up a road, pull up a road map for you. No problem. There we go. Hopefully you can see the relevant journey there. Yes, we can. Yeah. Fantastic. So this book essentially take, I mean, I, you know, to use the word journey in a business book um, is tricky, you know, but I had I couldn't think of any other words for it because it is a journey and journeys are full of discovery and surprises. And hopefully, you know, we leave enough space in our schedule for, you know, amazement and, you know, turn of events and all sorts of extraordinary things. And, and essentially that hopefully that's what this book delivers. Uh, the first part is all about context. And as I mentioned before, I don't think we can begin to approach our business lives without understanding the extraordinary shifts in context that we've all experienced over the last four years. You know, if we just think of our strategy pre-pandemic, and then we think of our strategy for the years every year in between, very different. And I mean, there is a question here, are we becoming used to a change in context? You know, the pandemic was quite extraordinary, certainly a global event experienced by everybody. But then of course we had Russia's war on Ukraine and that threw our supply chains into disarray as well as the cost of living and energy and you know everything around environment and that of course is still ongoing although the world's focus has shift, shifted and then of course chat gpt launching just over a year ago and i see today that gemini is just launched by bard um, its intro level and i think that this next year heralds an extraordinary if, if we thought of this last year with chat gpt has been extraordinary. I mean, just wait for what's coming, you know, in, in, in terms of disruption and change um, in people's jobs, in the division of labor in people's jobs. Um, th there's a whole bunch of stuff coming in it. But I, I've actually written, you know, quite a lot on living in an AI-infused world and leading in an AI-infused world. Um, so that's that's all part of this book. But the other thing, of course, is, is Hamas's original attack on Israel and the shifting dynamics in terms of geopolitics. We have yet to see this movie play out and we've no idea how this might, um, how this might impact us going forward. So are we becoming immune to the changes that are, are going on around us? Um, it depends what business you're in and how sharply you would feel that shift and change. But when we understand that we are, we cannot approach um, shifts and context with the same lenses. We need some, we need to be adaptable. Um, and of course, you know, it's easy to say we need to be, but everything I say we need to be, I actually give, give the, the reader ways to go about doing that. So, so everything's linked to practical application. So, so it starts off with that context. And then part one, as I mentioned, is really about you know, who am I? How do I understand the world? How do I understand myself better? The self-awareness, the self-knowledge. And we start off with, you know, what we're being asked to be today. You know, if we look at the, the attributes, the traits, the, the personality, the skills that we need to be, according to experts everywhere, today the list is long. <laughs> and the question is, yes, okay, so... So, you know, we need to be all of these extraordinary things. That's what businesses are looking for. If you start to read um, a little bit into job descriptions and into descriptions of company culture, you will see all of these words popping. Um, but how many people can are those things actually naturally? And can we change? Can we get better at being certain things? Um, you know, are, are we, do we have the ability to change? And of course, I grew up in a household where that old adage was a leopard never changes its spots. You know, in other words, when somebody shows you the truth of who they are, you know, believe them the first time <laughs> kind of thing. And yet we can change. And there was some extraordinary um, research over the period of the pandemic 
um, to show how CEOs and in fact every other job category um, changed quite significantly to adapt to what's going on. So anything we ever thought about the fact that people don't change is not true. Um, we, we change if we absolutely must, we have no choice, or if we absolutely have a strong, deep desire to change and we do something about it because everything in change is rooted in action. Um, so I always think of it as a backbone rather than a wishbone. And um, everything that we want to change requires action. So, so really having a look at, you know, through the lens of what we've been looking for, what qualities we've been looking for in people, what's needed today, what we, you know, can we change? How do we change um, personally uh, through that, the lenses of being future fit? And then having a look at our inner lenses, you know, what drives us? How do we understand the world? How do we form our mental models? Where do they come from? You know, when I, I can remember when I first started coaching and I probably didn't understand much of this. So the, you know, the beautiful thing about science and neuroscience, I absolutely love it, is that all of the, the wisdoms that we know to be true are now being proven in so many different ways. And that includes things along the lines of epigenetics and the brain-body connection and, and all of this good stuff. Um, so, so this idea of, you know, how do we shift our thinking? How do we um, build new neural pathways that allow us to create the type of thinking that's going to be to our advantage? And then, of course, you know, this is all about you. It's all about me. It's all about us taking care of ourselves. This extraordinary mind-body connection. There is no way an executive under huge pressure today can cope with what's coming at them from a resilience perspective without taking care of themselves. It's one of the most undervalued things because we've heard it all before. And I think the chapter is actually titled Self-Care, Our Grandparents Were Right. <laughs> so so the, the point here is that instead of glossing over the stuff, invest in it for yourself. Because if you're not doing that, you're not, it, it's really tricky under the kind of pressure we are in the changing context to be able to do what I've been talking about, which is shift the being that drives the doing so that you have a space in between you and what's going on and you can navigate the world so much better. And uh, so, so yeah, that's a, that's a big part of it. And actually I also dip into Ikigai and some other strategies that have proven themselves over centuries and hundreds of years. Um, so, so there's some really smart stuff in there. And then what is wisdom? You know, I need it. You need it. We all need it. Leaders need it. Political leaders need it. Do we see it? Do we know when it's present? I know in a meeting that if I'm sitting with a bunch of people, I know when it's not there, when there is not even a hint of inspiration. <laughs> and we know when, and in fact, one of our, our colleagues here at the Guild mentioned something during the pand pandemic about, you know, watching wisdom leave when your best people leave an organization. Um, it's tricky. And of course, it ignites a need to, to have a good look at what's going on. So this thing about wisdom has been so undervalued simply because we've heard about it for so long, but we know when we find it and it's deeply attractive, deeply compelling. Uh, so we dig into what that looks like, how we can be wiser. And the, along with a whole bunch of other things, we now have some extraordinary science to show brain imaging about people who are considered more wise than others. And those, um, those inner lenses that they've developed, their future fit capabilities, which all kind of fit together like a, a jigsaw puzzle, um, the areas that have been developed. And that sort of, I guess, that trusted advisor wisdom that when we come across it, we want more of it, um, how we can develop that for ourselves and, and how vital it is. And then resilience, you mentioned um, resilience, Rob, and it's a, it's a big topic because, you know, I think when we started at the beginning of the pandemic, my the inquiries I had for helping people to build resilience um, shot through the roof, and it's completely understandable. Um, we were looking for ways to help our teams to actually deal with the stress and pressure that people were under in the, these extraordinary circumstances. But these extraordinary circumstances keep happening. <laughs> so, so, you know, that, that sort of resilience, um, the ability to be resilient has turned into, it's not a sprint anymore, it's a race. It's something we need 
to create for ourselves and you know part of our being that drives the doing so how do we do that and resilience is an extraordinary thing it's something that we're not you know we don't have some lucky people who are born with this trait and others who aren't it's something that comes out of difficult times and we don't bounce back there's no bouncing <laughs> we kind of dribble our way forward forever inextricably changed by what we've experienced but if we have the consciousness to turn it into something that is useful, boy, can we use it time and again. So why that's important, what we can do to actually help ourselves there. And then we cannot talk about human beings um, and how you know our beings drive our doing without talking about digital addiction, without talking about this insatiable drive for more, which is actually an addiction if we look at it, you know, through that lens. So real sort of dive into what what this kind of quest for more the sensational drive to for more what the digital you know digital is just part of it i mean we can be addicted to anything even an emotion that makes us feel better and for me it's hard and dance salted caramel <laughs> i can name my addiction it's an easy one <laughs> it's my go-to place for comfort and uh, I, I think I mentioned the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, I sort of retreated to my sofa and sat there with, with a tub um, trying to figure out what was going on in the world. So we've got to understand our own lenses on the world, our own addictions, addictive side of, of, um, of who we are and why and what we do. And as I say, it could just be a feeling that we're addicted to. It needn't necessarily be drugs or alcohol or something that's considered socially unacceptable. Uh, plenty of people are addicted to work and shopping and sex and all sorts of things that perhaps, you know, don't need them stumbling around with a, a brown bag and a bottle. But um, it's very real and it's very prevalent in our, in our organizations and our people and our cultures as coping mechanisms. So, you know, this is all about creating awareness within us. And then part two, you know, if we have a look at the uh, the World Economic Forum, um, their top 10 skills for um, 2023 versus what they predict their top 10 skills will be. At the moment, we're sitting at analytical thinking at the top and creative thinking second, but they predict that that'll swap in the next five years and it'll be creative thinking and then analytical thinking. So for anyone who's ever schooled in the, in you're either analytical and you're smart and you go and do something in STEM or you're creative and you go and do something in humanities and you're not so smart, ch chuck that out. <laughs> because as we can see, of course, with the rise of, um, of um, AI and the division of work in, um, in our roles day to day, the very things that we need are probably the very things we've discounted before. So what does flow look like? What does it look like to be in flow? Um, part of that chapter is about the creative itch, you know, and, and what does that look like? It's different for everybody. Uh, so, you know, I, my father, for example, his greatest creativity was playing with numbers, you know, he said he could change the world with numbers, and he's right. You know, he could he could make things look any way he wanted with numbers. Uh, but for other people, it doesn't work like that. So, what does that look like? How do we ignite that for ourselves in the way that it works for us? And how can we use them in business today? Because without that, it's very difficult to navigate our way through. You know, old thinking, old structures, old way, linear ways of doing things, classic management theory. Yes, brilliant, we need all that stuff, but it's not enough. Uh, the world has undoubtedly changed. And this ability to dance with different situations with creativity, whatever that looks like for you, is absolutely vital. And then, of course, we've got to dig into learning because, you know, we're churning out young people. We had a great conversation, uh, Gina Clifford and I, in one of our in-conversation discussions on um, AI, living with AI. Um, I mentioned it, Ralph, we talked to Ralph as well, but we talked to Tanya Schindler, who is a, a futurist, and she just made this brilliant observation. She said, why don't young people do final exams together, collaboratively? Because actually we needed an entrepreneurship. We need people to be able to work together in the workplace and, and problem solve together. And you know whether you take that extreme 
um, version of what an education should look like. What is an education? So we sort of dig into that. And I also look at the future of learning because I don't think any, any senior executive in business today should be looking at learning within their organization in the same way. We need reskilling, we need upskilling, there are a whole bunch of things that need to be done. And if we broaden our lenses on what that looks like, uh, we've got a better chance of, rather than running in the same direction. You know, unfortunately, all our learning platforms are built on what worked yesterday. They're not built for the future. So it's something we've got to dig into and question. Um, ethics, ethical lenses, huge topic. So what is ethics? Um, you know, before, I would say before ChatGPT arrived, I would be guilty of checking the word out ethics without really deeply understanding it. But once that happened, I knew I had to dig in and understand what this means and how can I help uh, leaders to think in this way in order to make the decisions that will dictate people's lives uh, in the future. So really dig into the ethics piece. What are the different frameworks? How would you use them? What does it mean? And how can you, you know, use different combinations of things to make decisions that are ethical? And then, of course, a big piece on ethics and AI and, you know, having a look at what that actually means. You know, decision making is a difficult, difficult thing in today's world of work. And uh, there's so much stuff coming at us. If we don't have these filters, ethical filters, we, we cannot wait for institutions and governments to catch up with what is already on the table in terms of technology and the convergence of technologies. So ethics, a big piece. And, you know, somebody like me cannot write a book like this without talking about people, culture and lens, or, you know, people in culture lenses. You know, what does it mean to be equitable? The most extraordinary thing is when you look at organizations and you actually look at um, the diversity in organizations and equal pay, just look at those two lines you can tell exactly what an organization is opti optimizing for in the future or not. <laughs> so, you know, there are no surprises tomorrow or next year or five if we're not optimizing for where we want to be um, in five years time or in one year's time. And if we look at that just baseline, simple stuff going on in organizations um, through that lens, uh, I can tell you right now, if I had to join a company today, I would want to look at that because it would tell me how the executive team thinks about the future. And, you know, that's critical. So taking a look through all of that, just blowing away some cobwebs um, about what that looks like, what we can do with it, uh, what we should be looking at in terms of optimizing for the future. And, some, and by the way, there are loads of stories throughout this book, various experiences, examples, um, to, to, you know, bring this stuff alive. There's, um, I, I don't think there's something that happens pretty much most days of my life that don't have a, a rich, interesting, wonderful human story in it. So, so it's, uh, it's full of all of that. And then relating lenses, you know, how, how do we actually, how do we get on with other people? How do we um, communicate? You know, how do we, you know, storytelling is probably, you know, I think the chapter is actually titled Words Have Power. How do we, you know, how do we use words in the way that we need to? How do they affect our brain chemistry? How do they impact the people out there? You know, who, who is out there? You know, <laughs> uh, so storytelling is probably one of the most important things that leaders need today. And, uh, you know, what, what does that look like in its various different forms? And then also think things like, you know, sort of toxic positivity, the impact it's having um, on people and organizations and, you know, what does a toxic culture look like? Um, yeah, diving into all, all aspects of it, shadow side and, you know, wonderful bright light and everything in between. And I'm just looking at the time now. I'm going to make a fast march through part three and four. So part three, AI-infused world. I kind of dubbed it AI-infused world and future and leadership. Um, when everything popped about a, a year ago and I realized how profound the impact that this is having. You know, when we, when we sort of, if we're not deeply involved in technology and we're just using our phones and the tools that we have at work and, and what have you, the impact is felt gradually until something comes along and shakes up something personal to us. It could be 
your daughter's role was sort of hacked into, <laughs> you know, or it could be someone you know can't get a role anymore, or perhaps um, call center, you know, somebody who's daughter or son is in a call center and has lost their job or, you know, until it becomes personal, these thing, things can seem very incremental and gentle. So, oh, there's a lovely new tool, tool I've used that. We've been using AI forever. Um, but what, what is it? I, th I think we need a broader perspective on that than what just applies to us today because things are moving way too fast. So what does an AI-infused future look like? How do we lead in an AI-infused future? What are the ethics connected to it? So it's really starting to bring everything that we've built so far in this book and interweave it together to, to have a look at this lens. And then current context lenses, really addressing some of the big questions of our times. You know, who, what is the truth? Who do we trust? I mean, that's, that's a huge uh, question. How do we make decisions in an environment where we don't have reliable data? Uh, you know, if we're just relying on our filters, our lenses from the past, we're in trouble, deep trouble. So taking a look at some of the big things that are going on, um, cancel culture, what does work look like? <laughs> um, all of these things that are that are key. How do we make decisions? How do we filter it? How do we what sort of biases are we playing with? What's going on in the world? And if, if that brought you down, I then have to come back with optimistic lenses because <laughs> optimism is a mindset in a way. It's, you know, you, we either have to be active optimism, that's not just optimist, that's not just sitting back and hoping the world will be a better place, but being in action of making it a better place. And, you know, this all ties into systems. This, this whole book is full of systems everywhere. And um, if we think about, you know, every system that we have is based on systems that came before it. And every major systemic failure in society was once designed as a solution, a brilliant solution. Just look at household plastics and the issues that we now have um, with plastics in, in, our, um, in our oceans. And um, so, so can, you know, what we're designing today, which may even have altruistic benefits, there is always a cost environmentally and socially. Often we won't know that cost until some years down the line. And I think it's always a bit of a wake up call when we realize that the decisions that we're making for today, right now, will have consequences in the future, a future where the context has changed. Change. And a lot of people are not very conscious of that. We believe the world will be very similar in the future. And yet if the last four years have told us anything, or shown us anything, I should say, it's that it's unlikely to grow. <laughs> but in, in terms of actually being able to understand that, this really very difficult for us. So really having a look at, um, you know, what it means to have an optimism bias. 80% of us have it, by the way. Um, you know, it's not as if we're short of it, but how can we employ it? How can we walk with the line between realism and optimism? And, um, and a piece in there about the optimistic future, you know, and how we are responsible for ourselves and to others to create an optimistic future and how it's, it's really up to us. And then some emergent business paradigms. You know, there's a, a whole bunch of things that have been cooking for quite some time that are popping and our awareness of them is, is, um, is really getting there. So everything from B Corps and B Labs to conscious business to um, inner development goals, regenerative, regenerative economics, really just a quick run through of a whole bunch of things that are really powerful in theory, of course, um, where the whole idea with this book is you take what appeals to you right now that grabs you and uh, integrate it, you know, so that you get to keep it and then come back for some more. So if there's anything in that, that chapter, then yeah, <laughs> I saw that, Rob, thank you. One minute. If there's anything in there that inspires you, get going, put it into play and then come back for some more. And then part four almost doesn't need explanation. So I'm, I'm, we're okay with one minute, Rob. It's a walk through five key lenses that originated out of academia 
that I think that executives absolutely need today. And I've really tried to demystify things, deconstruct things, put things into ways that hopefully there's something in there that inspires you to pick up the mantle and dig deeper. And, you know, if you do, there are various experts and courses, wonderful, wonderful things that you can do to, to actually embed it for yourself and integrate it into your organization. So I'll just run through the five. Uh, conscious leadership, coherent teams or team coherence, um, systems thinking, complexity, sense-making and wayfinding, futures and foresight, and agile thinking and innovative behaviors. And those are kind of the five lenses that um, form the future focus lens um, engagement that is, is part of what I deliver for clients. And then a little sweet deconstruction at the end about the art and science of being, because I always talk about, or becoming, I should say, because I always talk, talk about becoming. I mean, we are this brilliant, ever evolving, dynamic um, world full of extraordinary humans who are always becoming. It, it will never be perfect, but it absolutely doesn't need to be. So thank you. So I'll excellent, please. Always excellent. Uh, I know you've got a number of projects going on, podcast, book. We have a couple of minutes only for, for questions here. I'm going to ask a quick one and then anyone else jump in, please. Um, uh, we're on a desert island. We get to bring two books. One of the books is relevant. What's the other book that we have to, to share, Louise? From me. Oh, um, Rick Rubin's The Creative Way. Excellent, excellent, excellent choice. I love it. Uh, uh, Nathan just asked, where is it? Where's the book? When is it available? I want to buy a copy. <laughs> so he's the music producer and um, he, you can get it. Uh, oh, uh, my book. Oh, yes. Book. Okay. Um, you can get it on Amazon today. <laughs> <laughs> it's an ebook for format if you prefer it's quite a big book so if you prefer scribbling and writing notes and please wait for the paperback that'll I think that will be published around about the 15th mid-month but I'll pop something up on LinkedIn and let you know when that's out um but yeah and, and I'd love your feedback if you do read it and you think it's okay please help me out with a review I've done sweet nothing around the marketing side um, I'm still in action writing indexes on master of disaster i love it i actually read your article or your submission and uncertainty again yesterday so i'm i'm very much in the louise mode today um question for you louise um and we're i grapple with it myself because i think really well done books in this world of 223 2023 and beyond tackle things with the complexity that is out there in the world i think you've done that with this book Having said that, there's going to be an audience out there that you may face that goes, look, I need my simple two by two matrix. Can you tell me the three questions that I need to know? And you've gone well beyond that. Do you, do you struggle with that tension now that you're writing this book yourself and how I comprehensively tackle the subject of, of future leadership while at the same time not leaving these other people that just want, please give me the end of the sentence? Yeah, I, I very much come at things from the perspective of not assuming or presuming anyone knows or gets anything and also not, you know, assuming or presuming anyone knows any less than I do or any more. You know, it, it's a, what I, what I, probably this book would be a lot shorter if I just went in and said, right, do these things. <laughs> but I've really kind of woven the golden threads all the way through and I hope I, I take people with me because what I'm not trying to do is say you know I'm not the originator of futures thinking or the futures triangle or any of these other brilliant tools or behavioral science you know I, I'm not the neuroscientist um, but there is extraordinary work out there that when we actually um, weave it together in context through a series of lenses of self-understanding it's so much easier to get the stuff so that's exactly what I've, I've done in terms of taking people through um, an interlocked, interwoven, interrelated journey. So, you know, you can either dip in an art and pick some things that you want to kind of pick up on um, or take the journey. And hopefully by the end of it, um, it's, you know, well, 
every step of the way. It makes perfect sense. One last question. Who's got the last question? Or I see Chris is in the green room. That's great. Louise, thank you so much for your time, effort, and brilliance in sharing with us. We look forward to reading it in depth and leaving good reviews and challenging questions to keep the conversation going because conversation is the essence of humanity. Thank you, Rob. Okay, so we are, I'm going to stop this. And I did this.